Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Welcome back, everybody. Good to have you guys here. Lights Out Podcast. We are very excited right now. We have another great interview. Ensign Inouye is going to be walking us through Kid Yamamoto, something we're all very interested in. This is a special relationship. He, he was in his corner all the time. Just He's going to know him like none of us do, so I can't wait to hear this one. Fascinating career. Um, hey, man, thanks for being here. I know it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a long time sometimes what we have to do but you know persevere come through for us like you do we really appreciate it yeah thanks man thanks for having me always good to of be course. on so chris a guy like ensign anyway obviously a legend within the sport one ladies and gentlemen we did a deep dive about ensign it's a phenomenal listen and it's ensign personally i think you said a lot of things you probably shouldn't have but that's what made the interview really cool. So with anyway, Chris, we've got, think about just tandems in MMA to just kind of go together. John Hackleman, Chuck Liddell, um, Kevin Randleman, Mark Coleman, Pedro Hizzo, Marco Huas. Ensign anyway and Kid Yamamoto have a bond that very few people in the world can kind of compete with in regards to just the things that they've done together. So Ensign, well, why don't we start with, how you met kid, the relationships with the family, and we'll move on from there. You know what? You know what? You know what? Before I even start with that, what's going to be real interesting? Had a bond. What? Had a bond. Okay. <laughs> Not because he's passed, but had a bond years before he passed. So it okay. might be like, it might be like an interesting, like, curveball for you guys today but <laughs> yeah 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 no for sure okay so um i actually uh i actually never heard of kid before because uh his two sisters were like like the the pride and joy of the family because they were uh you know kid was a good wrestler but his two sisters were like world champions yeah really oh yeah yeah his uh his older his older sister Mew was like a thirteen time uh, world champion. Wow! Uh, not world champion, Japan champion, and then she became three time world champion, but somehow had the Olympic jinx and never made it to the Olympics. Wow! Crazy. Yeah. So um, I never heard of him. Every time in the news or in TV, it was always about uh, the sisters, the sisters, the sisters. And you never nobody heard of, of kid at all. And uh, I um, actually met the younger sister at a club. We became friends. And I met the older sister when she was having problems with her marriage. So the younger sister brought her over to the gym to train. And that's how I met her. Ended up getting, you know, started to date the older sister, Mew, and then ended up marrying her. So when I was dating Mew, when I was dating Mew is when um, kid, kid, I knew, they always talked about him. They really admired him as a brother. So they always talked about him. And um, he had a, um, he actually had a Yakuza problem in the university he was at. <laughs> he was uh, around the town playing around with an airsoft gun. And it's not, it's not the kind you find in the States where the BBs will penetrate somebody. It's more, it, it stings and it hurts. So it's a, more of a more plastic bullets, but it travels fast and far. So he apparently was fooling around in the town shooting his friends and he shot a Yakuza guy in the face. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So that became a big problem where the guy went to the school, he went to his apartment to find them and everything. And I remember being at a wrestling tournament with Mio and they got a phone call because he was in a he was in the running down the street because a Yakuza guy came to his apartment and he jumped out the second floor balcony 
to get away. So I got on the phone and I advised him to get into a family restaurant somewhere where there's a lot of people. And I made some calls. So, okay. yeah, so, got so him how, off hurt, that. how hurt was this Yakuza guy by the airsoft? Nothing. Gun? He was just pissed off. Yeah. And this lasted for weeks. Um, this was going on. No, it actually happened the, the, in the, within a week when it was started happening is when I had to take care of it. Holy sh! Okay. Uh, unfortunately. Okay. So an apology isn't good enough at, at this point. Yeah, well, yeah, they probably, yeah, the way the Yakuza run is that the, the, the proper apology is a financial apology. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're they're like, they're, yeah. like, how they're does probably, somebody get out of that predicament? Like, am I on mute? No, no, you're good no. to go. Go ahead. Okay. Like, how does somebody get out of that predicament without the magic of Ensign anyway? Like, what would he have done without you kind of thing? You'd probably have to pay it off. How much would that pay? Would that be pretty significant? Well, something like that was like an airsoft. Didn't draw blood. Didn't um, hurt him at all. Probably be like 30000 20000 30000 would probably do it depending on the person, depending on the guy asking for it. Yen? 30000 yen? $30,000. So about oh, 2 whoa, million yen man. or 3 million yen. You'd have to write a check in. <laughs> Yeah, no yeah. cash in for about four years. Yeah, no <laughs> the, the unfortunate thing about that is before they went to his apartment, they went to his school. So okay. and as you know, any 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 um, education, you know, any college, any high school, any, you know, as we know about the rising problem, any, any television, you know, big company, if they're here, if they have any Yakuza problems, they'll, they'll pretty much step away from that person because they want no Yakuza problems. Yeah. So, okay. so the, 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 his, his university kicked him out of the school. <laughs> man, Japan's wow. a rough place, man. And on top of that, when the wrestling association found out about the problem, they put him on a, a probation period of a year that he couldn't wrestle. Whew. Boy, so he's got to pay the Yakuza and have to deal with that. Yeah, well, yeah. So what happened was I knew a lot of people that were high up, so I could easily squash that problem without any payments. And the unfortunate thing, like I said, is that they already went to the you know contact association and they already went to the school. So these guys, to avoid any Yakuza problems, had to reprimand kid. Mm. So, so the reason why we got close is because when, um, you know, he came to talk to me and about, you know, he, he can't wrestle and I heard about that problem. So I actually offered him to come to, come to the gym and not, not, not quit wrestling, but since he can't wrestle, why don't he just come to the gym and train MMA? Cause it's almost the same movement. It'll keep yeah, him so agile, work out. keep him in yeah. good shape. So. Keep my I point. offered him that, and he took it up and came into the gym and started training. And that's how I actually met him. Now, he went to high school in Japan for three years. Four years. Four years. He did his entire high school in Japan. Yeah. Oh, no. In Arizona. I apologize. Arizona. Arizona. Yeah. He went to Arizona. Okay. Yeah. Like Marcos Deniza, Arizona. Or high school in, in like Tempe, Arizona. Um, was that due to the fact that he had Yakuza problems or was it his father trying to get him a wrestling edge? The, the father was, it was all for wrestling. I think Townsend Saunders was his wrestling coach there. Am I correct? Yeah. I think oh, they, he also worked with Frank Trigg. Wow. Wow. Okay. So when he first came over to your MMA gym, I mean, did he, was he a natural? Did he take to it very well right away? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, he would uh, he would be able to hang with the purple belt jujitsu guys because in the grappling because his of, of his wrestling movement. I mean, yeah. we all know that wrestling's like the sport to do if you want to be good at MMA. You got to do wrestling, man. Yeah. So, so let, let me let me ask you. So he's always had a reputation as kind of being a little bit of a bad boy. Now he was you know fooling around with an airsoft soft gun there and stuff like that. 
his whole wrestling career, like, did, was it out the window at this point, or did he still have a chance there going on? And and also, so, like, you know, he was a pothead to it. You know, we could talk about that later. But do you think he picked that up in Arizona? Um, I'm not sure we picked it up, but it was because uh, I didn't really know him when he was in Arizona, so I don't know much about that. It was before was you met him, Arizona. correct? I met him after. Okay, so just so everybody knows, he goes to Arizona for high school, doesn't speak any English before getting there, takes third place his freshman year, wins state the following three years. The dude's an absolute stud. Wow. I have to assume, like, the Yamamoto family, if the sisters show up at your door, it's problematic. You add kid, you know, you might as well just give them what they want. (laughs) Wow. So he's in Arizona does this thing, comes back, has his issue, comes with you. Now, prior to him starting his MMA career, there was a lot of, this is just from, from what I've read, there was a lot of family issues. The father, the patriarch of the family, had issues with MMA. Am I correct? Yes. Well, the father didn't really have issues with MMA until after the year probation was over. He was back. He was reinstated back into the wrestling association, and I think a couple of years from then, um, it was actually the men's wrestling was actually going to be in the Olympics. So the dad wanted him to return back to wrestling, and he didn't want to. <laughs> so and so the dad, the dad okay, actually went and called me, and told me to make him. So that was like his coach and his mentor. And they, they, the dad wanted me to make him go back to wrestling, make him quit fighting. And he, uh, he looked at me and said, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to fight. And I, and I, I told him, you know, what I felt was if you're not wholeheartedly into wrestling, you're not going to be able to get ready for the Olympic level level. So if his heart's not in it, it will be a waste of time. And if his heart's in fighting, he, I thought he could be really good. So, um, I told him that, hey, um, I'll support you 100%. And he's wasting time not being in the sport of fighting. Yes. And so now I'm a firm believer. There's certain sports you can't do. if, you, Like, if, you, if you're not into golfing, you could probably go do it. No big deal. Maybe tennis. I don't know. But, I mean, if you're not into, like, wrestling, you're going to – or fighting, you can't do those sports. That takes such a 100% commitment, and you have to want that more than anything. If you're not into it, it's not going to work. I mean – and I don't know how you could convince his father that but if you're not into it, it it's imp- you, 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 there's no way you can do it. And you're talking about you're talking about Olympic level, you know? Huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's yeah, a so, different animal. So, um, you know, I, I when when I when he said he wanted to fight, um, I didn't want to waste my time. Also, so I took him into the gym the next day, and uh, I'm a lot bigger than him. I, I did a volley two of those sparring with him and pretty much beat him up real bad. And his to a point where his face was pretty swollen, his eyes were shut. And I waited for the next day when he when he came the next day and I told him uh training at six. He said, shoot, let's go. So when he was willing to come back to the gym the next day, I thought, ah, oh, this guy, I, I'm not gonna be wasting my time with this guy. And that's when I we started going full on with it. So what happened with the father was because we didn't uh, um, agree with what he did, the father 100% cut him off. Wow. Uh, Ensign, if you're not comfortable answering this, I mean, we'll, we'll edit it out. Did Because in Japan, obviously, there's, the culture is a lot different than almost any, obviously anywhere else in the world. But the father, when the father says something, that's the law. Whether you agree with it or whether you or disagree, you have to do it because that's kind of how things happen in that culture. Do you think the father, when he saw a kid gravitate towards yourself and not listen to him, do you believe that maybe that affected your relationship or you became the bad guy of the family? No, uh, that had nothing to do with it. It was all about the father. His whole life was resting. I'll tell you stories of what this guy's done to his family for wrestling. Everything was wrestling. Wow. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, so I he just wanted I, kid to return to wrestling. That's all it was. And when he didn't, he said, he's disowning him. He's cutting him off. And he cut him. He cut him off. No financial aid, nothing. 
Wow. It, it, it didn't, he didn't like maybe come down on you for not helping him out. And his kid is always at your gym at this point. He didn't kind of transfer that negative energy towards yourself. Nothing that I recognize, but I'm pretty sure he wasn't too happy with me. <laughs> but um, nothing that he's told me or expressed to me or nothing that I've heard from kid or his sisters. Nothing personal. I mean, it's well, funny that I'm saying this because I really despise the guy and I dislike him. And you'll find out why in the later on in this podcast. But um, just I'm just being 100% honest. Anson, you I would love to been. say that he had a grudge against me because of that. That's why he was being a dick and everything. But it's deeper than that. There's a bigger problem in that man that made it this. That wasn't the problem. That was a, would have been a very minor problem if that was the problem. Mm. Oh, what, let's move to his... Uh... Well, his father, Ikiyu, represented Japan in the 1972 Olympics. That's the, the Munich year. But let's yeah. go back to Kid. March 2nd, 2001, Shudo to the top number two, Masato Shiozawa. It's his debut for both fighters. What was it like preparing Kid for that fight? What was his attitude like in the locker room? Which fight was that? It was his first fight. It was Masato Shiozawa. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, that was a K. Was that the K one fight? No, it was Shudo to the top two. Oh, we 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 had him. He was ready because uh, we I had him before he fought that. He fought in the amateur Shuto. I didn't see any of that. That was within a year of him even training. He went to amateur Shuto and dominated the whole tournament and won the whole thing. <laughs> okay. And. You know, with his style, the way he won the amateur shooter, you know, amateur shoots all about points. So you take him down, you get two points. You can take him down and just stay in the guard. You got two points. You, you, I mean, you win the match, you know. And kid's strength was being on top. And he had – his ground punching was really heavy. Yeah. So the thing with that is uh, without the ground punching and the amateurs, he still dominated. So we're – I was really excited about him getting into the pros because – now with the punching, oh my god! I'm thinking I can't wait to for the for the fight scene to see this guy. So yeah, well, I, the expectations was he was ready, man. So we just worked around his wrestling. His striking was a little skeptical, but he he could strike enough to use to cover his wrestling. And who was he? Who was he preparing with? Like in your gym, in terms of. Shudo at 145, right around that time, had some of the best guys in the world, you know. And I mean, he, he didn't start off with the bet, you know, with Uematsu or Pequeno or anyone like that. But eventually, you know, that's still rough going and stuff. Who was he preparing with? Like, what was that like at the beginning? I had a lot of fighters come to my gym to train, and at that time that he was there, uh, the the top guy in our gym that was working with him a lot was Tetsuji Kato. Okay, and I know and just so happened at that time, Barrett Yoshida was also training with me at the at, in Japan. Okay, so, so that was his two major training partners. Barrett's more of a, a grappler, but Kato grappler. could strike really well. So oh yeah, yeah, he fought my guy Strasser. Kato did. I know him really well. Um, so here's my question. Then, so this is around 2001. On the internet, there's a listing, and I haven't seen it. I wish I, I, I had found it, but he actually had, like, a, a grappling match or a series of grappling matches in something called the Contenders, where he fought, like, Wakabayashi, and he wound up losing it to Yoshida, to Barrett. What, uh, what was that about? Can you re re refresh our memory on that? Okay, yeah, so he, they entered the Contenders, and they're both, you know, they're training partners, so um, they... Uh, you know, they were um, both on each the opposite sides of the tournament. And when when they had to meet in the finals, you know, of course, it's a grappling match, so that wasn't a problem. So we uh, we just decided that they go spar, you know. So that wasn't a big problem at all. They just sparred. And, you know, Barrett was, uh, uh, you know, you know Barrett, man. He was like an He's extreme, bigger too. A yeah. great grappler. So, of course, you know, Barrett would have the upper hand. So that was... Uh, that was what happened there at the contenders, yeah. So coming out of his first pro fight, um, what, what was 
his attitude? Did the family mood change? Did his sisters support him? The sisters always supported him. Okay. Neil and Seiko, they always supported him. Uh, the father never did. The father was pissed off that he didn't come back to wrestling, didn't support the fighting, didn't like MMA at all. The father was totally against it. Hmm. Wow. Wow. So his second fight, um, a few months later, is July 6, 2001. Shudo to the top six. He fights the Cobra Kai gym, but... Masashi Kameda, who um, I think on that fight is kind of where Kid really got confidence in his hands. Yeah. Well, I at that point already, I was taking uh, Kid to Thailand a lot. He was moving with me every day in my training, everything I did. Uh, we went to Thailand to train at Santi and Noi's gym. Uh, rest in peace. He's, he just passed, but we were training there still. So, and the, the thing with Kid was amazing was he picked up stuff really fast, really f- even striking, you know. I mean, wrestling, yeah, you pick up the ground fast because your whole movement is wrestling. But <laughs> he picked up the, the standing really fast. I mean. He hit like a Mack truck. Yeah, he hit hard. And he was impossible to submit as well. It was very hard to submit. His movement <laughs> and his explosion. He had that instinct of when to move and where to move. So one of the things, and obviously it's later on in the career, kid gets so comfortable that I I haven't seen video of it, but I've been told that he used to smoke in between rounds occasionally. Is that true? (laughs) Um, Not, not, not when I was his coach, that would never happen when I was his coach. If anything, I, at that time, I never smoked weed and was against it. I didn't think, uh, Weed was something that would be good for stamina. So at that time, you know, I was, uh, all my fighters knew that I was against weed. And if they did that, they would have to do it behind my back without me knowing. And as of, as far as I know, when I was cornering him, he's never done that. Okay. That's fair. Hey, hey, let me, let me ask you a, a, a quick question though. Um, so at this point, you know, he's rising and he's dedicated to MMA, but with the wrestling stuff, he was getting, you know, he, he comes from a family. Did they have Yakuza pressure, like to stay in wrestling? Because that's a lot of what sometimes happens there, you know? And I know, like, maybe we'll talk about it later, but his sister eventually also, like, his sister's the gold, the world champion. She also did MMA. That must have killed their father. So, no. No, there is, there's a there's a whole we're getting to it, but there's a whole big movement behind that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and so, the other part was that I know Japan's a very different culture without a lot of street fighting, but the kid indulging a little street fighting every once in a while, like with the aerosol guns and stuff like that, was <laughs> he reminds yeah, me of Eddie well, Alvarez, like a Japanese to answer, version. <laughs> to answer your first question, no, the Yakuza had no involvement in pressuring him to wrestle or pressuring the family to stay in wrestling. The sisters were always supportive of him. He, The sisters were not MMA fighters at all. They were still wrestlers. So he was actually still help, sparring with them for their wrestling. So, yeah, there was no, there was, it was just a personal choice. The sisters supported him. The father, for some reason, refused to support him. You know, I, I always feel that the wrestling was more important than his family's desires. Yeah. It was ego. It, it was ego. Yeah. So, what was that? What was the second half of the question you just asked me? Thinking so, about whether he street fought, like you, if you knew he had oh, a couple of All the time, all the, all the time. <laughs> okay. I, I had to, there was a huge one where he fought at a club and he knocked, he, he choked out this uh, world champion boxer, or Japan champion boxer, Hozumi. And nice. he, <laughs> he knocked him out on the street and then the guy woke up, didn't know what happened, said, I didn't lose, I want to fight again. He took him down, mounted him. Choked him out again. The guy has a you know boxers in Japan have a lot of yakuza connections, and he started calling kid to threaten him. So I went. I had to go down to his boxing gym. I went down. I, I like to do things by myself because I don't like to feel like I'm trying to threaten people. So I go. To, I went down to his gym by myself. Talked to the talk to the owner of the gym, and I just let him know that you your your student and my student just had a fight. 
And I just want to let you know there's no problem with you and me, but it's a problem with them, and we're going to have to f- fix that. The, the, the owner of the gym was super cool. He said, okay. And, um, you know, he was, Hozumi wasn't there, so I just left the gym. I got a call on the phone hit with, from him, like, as I was driving away threatening me, calling me a piss pussy and telling me why the fuck you come to my gym. So I, of, of course, you know, I U-turned, went back. <laughs> <laughs> went in, went in fr- confronted him with, he had like eight guys with him. I confronted him and he, he started lying to me. I told him, I know you threatened me because I heard it on kid's cell phone because he was in a recording. He said he denied it. So I went on the phone, called kid over, said, come over to the gym. He came over and uh, that that boxer guy starts playing this real big drama act and starts saying, I'm telling the truth. And if you don't believe me, you can hit me. So I'm like, OK, okay um, before I do anything, I want to just explain to you that I don't know you. And kid is like my little brother. I said, so if I'm going to believe someone, I'm going to believe him. So is it OK if I hit you? And then this guy had like second thoughts. <laughs> he gets a phone call apparently his backing in the Yakuza was one of the guys that really liked me so he gets a phone call from the guy he goes outside he comes running back into the gym at the verge of tears or pretty much later on he did actually said tears the guy the Yakuza he said please you gotta talk to him he's gonna take his finger to show remorse to you so he can apologize. And he said that he will do it. Please stop him. Please stop him. So I got on the phone. I talked to the Yakuza guy. I said, you know, that's not necessary. I said, we can squash it right here. We'll squash it. Don't worry about it. He goes, okay, thank you. Went to the gym. Agreed to not go to the authorities. We agreed to just drop it. Um, Did they shake hands? Did they shake hands? Yep, they shook hands. It was squashed. And everything was good. Everything was done. And it was cool. But, uh, you know, the funny thing is uh, two years ago, this uh, boxer actually got on his uh, one of his uh, social medias and actually said that he called me out to fight and I got scared and I didn't show up at the spot. Ooh. <laughs> out of Ooh. the blue, you know. And then, so I people started messaging me on social media that Hozumi saying this about saying that about me. Ten years ago, I would have found him and and we would have had it out. Right now, you know, it's not worth it. I yeah. just uh, I laughed about it, and you know what happened? Just a couple months ago, he got arrested. He's in jail now. So, <laughs> yeah, karma, karma, bitch. Bitch. karma, you know, and, bitch. And, <laughs> and uh, ladies and gentlemen, just so you guys know, that little tidbit right there, which is what makes Ensign one of our favorite guests. Ensign, you have a podcast, and it is full of stories like this would you mind plugging your podcast for everybody because i listen to it yeah it's called the yamato damashi podcast and i love um, spelling that <laughs> it's what's what's really cool about it is uh the guy i joined up with from the uk he's a huge fan so he knows what the fans want to hear he knows what to talk about he knows what we should what questions to ask so it's perfect so you know it's a uh, it's real interesting because uh, I started that whole thing not because of money or financial. I started the podcast because I, wa- I was I'm probably one of the most misunderstood people in fighting. And I just wanted people to understand my mindset, why I did things, what I do in the fights, what I did. You know, I'm not this invincible guy with no fear and, 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 and pain tolerance that's like Superman. No, I'm not like that. I'm normal. And it's, I think it's a mindset and the, the, you know, the, my, my mindset that I have and the mental strength that I have that makes me a little bit special. So yeah, the yeah. podcast covers all that. And it's pretty um, no holds barred. As you guys it's, probably a, it, know. it's a phenomenal yeah. listen. Chris, a phenomenal oh. listen. One of my favorites. One of, absolutely oh, one of my favorites. Glad you enjoy it. <laughs> so, right on. so with the last fight, just to kind of make things come full circle, that Kamita had powerful kicks and was very long. Kid kept running into like championship height and it's at 145 where kid, I think eventually made it down to 125. So it's up like he, he's fighting above his weight class. It may even have been yep. 55. I apologize. It was at 155, I believe. Um, 
which is 20 pounds heavier than, than kid when he was uh, at his peak. Um, September 2nd, 2001, um, Shudo again, Hideki Kadawa, very strong body kicks, five foot nine, 145 pounds out of Urishi Dojo, another stud. Like you're not yeah. protecting him at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, he want. I mean, it was all, he wanted to fight those guys. He wanted to fight the best. And I felt he was ready. Well, do you remember his next pro fight? It was in Honolulu, Hawaii. With, um, with uh, the puck. Josh, Josh Thompson. Yeah. Josh so, Thompson, yeah. Oh. His third pro fight is against a future title contender, Josh Thompson. Wow. Well, do you remember what happened? Out? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, this one. Yeah, Josh Thompson was definitely a lot a better fighter than him. What Kid had was all he had was a, his speed. And because he was a wrestler, he went in southpaw. And because he was actually an orthodox right at righty, a righty, because he was southpaw, his front hand was a power hand. So it was a really unusual way to fight back in that day. And, you know, it, he didn't have that, that um, regular style of an MMA fighter. His striking was real. Like, I, remember, I remember Josh in his corners calling it the goofy punch. Be careful of the goofy punch. <laughs> so Josh was 2-0 and at the time Crazy Bob Cook is in his corner If you look at Josh's career He doesn't really get good Until he takes his hands off of his body And starts fighting long And do you remember how that fight ended? Yeah, a groin kick So Josh kicked And, and Kid Yamamoto is 5'4 Josh Thompson is 5'10 Josh kicks Yamamoto in a groin it, it, it seemed like that was a very, very serious problem for him. Like he had to be go to the hospital possibly afterward. Okay. This is a, um, uh, I'll just give you, I'll just give you guys everything. hundred percent truth. It wasn't that bad. Really? Yeah. Explain. Kid was tired. Kid was tired. Was it the jet lag? No, it was a kid that has a problem with stamina. He explodes so much that he gets tired. Even in his wrestling, his whole wrestling career was like that. He could have been like the world champion if he had, he could control his stamina because he would always, even when I went to watch him, he took second in the, uh, the, the college, all Japan college. He goes out ahead on the guys like eight zero and he gets tired. And then they just start creeping up. And they eventually, eventually outpointed. I've seen him lose like that two or three times. So we already knew that he had problems with his stamina. And I could see him slowing down in that Josh fight. He was getting the upper hand. And when he got hit in the growing, he's a young fighter. And I just, in the corner, this is exactly what happened in the corner. Is uh, I looked at him and I said, how are you feeling? He goes, I'm okay. I said, are you tired? He said, yes. And I said, is your stamina blown? He said, yes. And I said, well, if you don't want to continue, then just the groin shot's enough. It's my and that's what happened. And, and, you know, he doesn't take a loss, but he gets the learning experience. And he, he understands, you know, what dedication. Well, you know, and, and that's another thing, yeah. Mike, you know, it's like when you first start off, man, that's, that's, that's a tough fight to be in and, you learn how to control yourself way better, you know, and, and so to get out of that, you know, I get it, man. You blow your watch. After I've done that in a fight, I'm like, I never want that to happen again. When you have nothing left, you learn. It's like You're the like, worst I thing to energy. experience. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So I get it, man. He, he got in there. He learned that. And, and hopefully they could be like, okay, I don't want that ever happen again. I have to train different. I have to fight different. I have to learn how to take breaks in there when I'm fighting. You can't. You can't go hard the whole time. You can't, you know, just go on red the entire time. I can't. Only people who are doing that are on some EPO or some some drugs. People do that seven hours. Stuff. I don't know how. They, you don't. You get tired in a fight. Some guys don't get tired now. I think anybody who doesn't get tired is on something. I don't understand. Absolutely. That. Absolutely. Yeah. So you know, you know the thing with that. The the this where the reason why I made the decision was because he was outclassed. Josh was a better fighter. He was getting mm. lucky on those goofy punches, but 
it was going to be a matter of time when Josh and Bob Cook figured it out. Mm. And, you know, Josh is a lot bigger. Yeah, Josh it's a huge, huge size really, difference. Josh cuts huge. weight really well. Yeah. And Kid didn't cut weight because he was just too small for the division. And, you know, it might not be the, you know, the samurai way to, to do it, but it was the way out. And I think even till today, I don't think Josh didn't even notice. Well, you got to look at it this way, too. You're looking at a 125-pound fighter fighting at 145 against a guy that's probably coming down from about 165, 170. Big difference. So is it the samurai way out? No, but you guys took on a challenge that, I mean, you're looking at three or four weight classes in difference. Yeah, that was into consideration too. Yeah, and the fact that he was such a green uh, fighter yet, he had to, he needed to learn more. Yeah, no, when we interviewed Josh, he, he felt like the end of the fight was a little bit of a, like he could like, he didn't feel like he connected, but that's okay. I, and thank you for your honesty and explanation. Yeah. Because, well, and, 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 like you said, it makes sense. You know, people, it's the fan that's sitting there, you know, with his belly saying, I wouldn't have done that. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know what, you know, what gave me a little bit of compromise on making that decision <clears throat> is when I, uh, whoever, if you guys ever got hit in the cup with a baseball or a kick, you know, that shit takes a toll on you. And, you know, regardless if you feel recovered or not, there might be a, a you know, in the, in the, mart of mar the art of mixed martial arts, you know, even a split second of a little bit of delay and, you know, reaction time, you know, it could affect the fight. So, I, you know, I, he said he's okay, um, but I felt that, you know, his stamina is gone and we don't know how much it's actually going to slow him down. That, that's yeah. a great point right there. I've seen many guys who they'll take a bad shot, an illegal shit, knee to the face or whatever in UFC level. Like, I want to fight. I want to fight. And they get beat right away afterwards. It's like, man, I know it's tough to be like, I can't fight anymore. That's not what you want to do as a fighter. But it's definitely a smart thing to do sometimes. You're going to go out there. You're probably going to lose. You know what I mean? So is that worth it or not? I don't know. So, so you know, the, the it's, a, it's a job of the, the fighter to give everything he got. And it's a job with a coach to watch the safety and the well-being of the fighter. I love it. Yeah. I always tell people, like, to me, as a fighter, it's your job to go out there and be willing to die in the ring. And it's a corner man's job to make sure that never happens. You know what I mean? Their job is to keep you safe. My job is to fight until I'm told to stop. And if everybody does their job, it works out perfect. The problem is when you get a, a coach or a manager who's braver than the fighter. You know what I mean? That's when the problem is. But you have to have yeah. that good relationship with you. Trust each other, man. That, that's what it's all about. Yeah. <laughs> so, Ensign, did did kid did he not recover well? Because sometimes guys will take a round off and then they're back to you know running the track again. Did was he just one of those guys? Once the tank was empty, he couldn't fill it back up again. Yeah, because so he was a you, as you he's know, his whole, his whole strength yeah. was speed and explosion. Yeah, and once but he loses that, it's a it's a different fighter. Yeah, there, there's two types of, of of bodies. One that does like marathons and the other one that's just a short powerful distances and he's a he's a he's a power power guy yeah which that's yeah. Right. yeah that's excellent so he rebounds uh with that fight um rebounds except he he winds up against stephen pauling who is a guy from tko you know he fought in like a lot of the canadian regions i believe he's an east coaster um no 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 no, no. Is Pauling, is he Canadian? Hawaii, from Hawaii. Oh, he's a Hawaiian. Yeah, he's a Hawaiian from Super Bowl. Bowl. He did TJ's show a lot. Okay. Yeah. So he takes a loss, his first loss, actually. So he has two fights in a row where he has issues. Well, the Stephen Pauling fight wasn't that big of a deal because uh, it was a striker grappler. It was a striker grappler matchup. Real plain and simple. And it was a matter of if the striker can hit him before he takes him to the ground. And as we know, he got, he got caught with a knee and it wasn't a knee enough to, to hurt him enough that he had, he had to, he got knocked out or, or he, he lost the fight because of the knee. It was because the angle of the knee caught him in the right place and it opened up a huge gash on his head. Mm. And it, it was funny because when he came to the corner, I looked at the gash, you could see his skull. Ugh. 
So I was like, oh, fuck. And then I, I, I knew it was going to be stopped. And the doctor stopped it. He was pissed off. I just grabbed him. I said, hey, dude, it's a good stoppage. Um, well, if you get stopped due to a cut, man, that's different. And to me, I mean, he didn't get knocked out. He could have kept going if his life depended or something. But, I mean, I've been stopped by cuts. So ain't nothing you can do about it, man. The referee says I stop it. You got to stop it. Yeah, so that, that loss wasn't really a big deal. You know, we, we understood. It was, it was for him. It was like. He felt really unlucky and he had the bad, you know, the bad luck. But other than that, it wasn't like he felt bad about his career or him as a fighter. It was one of those things that happened, you know. Was there bad blood between himself and KZ Factory, Tetsu, Tetsuo, Tetsuo, Katsuda? Not at all. Well, a kid in that fight, which was his next bout, um, continued to strike him afterward and had to be like physically pulled off by several people, including yourself. <laughs> that was um, the only way I can say anything about that is that's kid. That's a kid, man. <laughs> that's a competitor, right? Just being a competitor, one of kid keeps fighting. Sticking his tongue out at him and just kind of was that him just kind of shaking off the last two fights and establishing himself so there was nothing personal between these two um no i think it was just him it was just him uh being kid man uh he just wanted to hit him more i mean so, i mean and so would you say he, he was, was he a showman you would say so he wanted to go out there and put on a show for everybody was that part of it you think 100 percent, 100 percent. watch him watch him in his ring entrances he's a showman yep that's so I, I went to a couple like message boards and I had seen uh, that prior to this kid was saying Tetsuo was saying bad things about his family. But I think that was just kind of something he was saying. No, the only or, thing that he, uh, he did say was um, he, Tetsuo is also a wrestler. So he did mention that... Uh, Wrestling and MMA is two different things, so he's going to show them what MMA wrestling is all about. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't like he had bad blood or he hated them. It was, it's true. What, what he said was true. <laughs> it is true. And, you know, I guess when Kid caught him with a good shot and knocked him out, he just wanted to hit him a couple more times, you know? Yeah. I, I, know, no, the, I know the feeling. It's not like I've never done that. <laughs> <laughs> A couple times. Yeah, a couple times. Um, his next fight is against somebody that, in my opinion, at one point was probably one of the top three in the world at the lower weight classes. It's May 9, 2003, Super Bowl Hawaii. He fights Jeff Karam. Yeah. That's a huge so, fight. Yeah, Jeff is awesome. It, it was pretty one-sided, but Karam is impossible to finish, and he, he, he always shows like incredible grit in his tougher fights. Yeah, now, yeah. Jeff is just a good fighter. Did Kid break his rib in that bout? He, I, I saw him holding his rib like underneath his arm. No, it wasn't broken. It was just uh, you know how you twist and you kind of strain the tendons or 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 rupture the tendon tendons. Not not nothing like a broken rib. But it, hmm. it was okay. Did, was there a lot of hype behind Kid at this point? Did you know you had something special on your hands? Yeah, I knew. I knew I had something special. We, it's just about um, showing the world what we had. You know, I knew it's something special. And I felt that what was really important as a coach is to groom him the right way and and present him the right way. You know, not give him too – don't don't put him over his head yet. Well, Korean is definitely a tough fight. I mean, for sure. He's a local guy here. He's got a gym. Um your, his next bout is against a five foot ten Machete, Khalid Mitchell. He's back in Shudo, one of Caesar Gracie's original students. Yeah, I mean, I, I knew he wasn't going to have problems with rappers because his yeah. wrestling was good. You know, you know, as you know, wrestling is the middle point between standing and jujitsu. <laughs> so, as a wrestler, he can control where he wants the fight to be, and he. With Kaleb, his striking was a lot better, so it was easy for him to just stay standing. Yeah, I knocked him out 40-second knockout. Um, yeah, I believe, that, like that I said, one of the original. Right 
<laughs> yeah, one of the original Caesar Gracie students. And then you guys switched to K1 from Shudo, which is something that doesn't happen often. What was well, the reason for that? Well, K1 is uh, we had an offer because he was becoming big. See, he still wasn't a superstar yet, but because he was coming big, we got an offer from K1. So I met with uh, the promo- um, the the promoter, um, Tanigawa. I think Ishii Kancho was already having problems with the law, so he was already kind of stepping back. So um, Tanigawa was the man. So I met up with him, and, you know, I talked to Kid, and I asked Kid, you know, we're we getting offers from K1. You want me to move forward with it? He said, and said, K- K1 was the shit. There was no pride. <laughs> K1 was the show to be in. So, um when that happened, he said uh, he wants to fight in K1. He said that's that's his dream. And so when I went to talk to Tanigawa, it's funny because the first offer Tanigawa had for me was thirty thousand dollars a fight for four fights a year, and I was and and back in that day, that was pretty good money because kid was fighting for like fifteen hundred to three thousand shuto. Real good then. So I yeah so I played I played the um. I played that, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure. Inside, I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> Kid would fight for free to fight K1 ring. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, oh, let's see what this guy can do. So I said, oh, let me think about it. And I, I guess he didn't want me to leave the table. And he said, how about 50000 Oh, wow. And I said, and, and, you know, Kid's not a striker, so... He said a four year, a, a one year, four fight contract. And I told him, how about a $50,000 fight contract for two years for four fights, for eight fights? So you're talking like almost a quarter mil. Yeah. So oh, he agreed wow. to that. I, he agreed to that. I brought it, I came back and talked to Kid. And I told Kid, um, Oh, he must have been howling at the moon. Oh, he, he told me he would have fought for free in K1. But he said he hugged me, he thanked Thank me. Thank God he had you. <laughs> and then and then what I what I did, okay, this is what I did. I never took a single penny from Kid. So what I did was I called K1 back and I told them that, hey, this is one of my students. He helps me teach some classes. If he's going to have to fight in your ring, he's going to, it's going to take away from me. What are you guys going to do for me now? And this is totally separate aside from the contract. So K1 agreed to pay me $10,000 every time he fought. Nice. Man. So, uh, yeah. So I got every time he fought in K1, I got 10 grand, but it was nothing out of kid's pocket. That's fantastic. That's, that's, that's the best deal. Right there. Yeah, it's the best deal. Yeah. For everybody. Yeah. I was helping kid because I wanted to help kid. I wasn't helping kid financially at all. And, you know, back in that day, MMA wasn't fi- a financial gain. So the, the, it was at least the last thing on my mind is try to financially get profit from fighting. Well, I, I think at this point, MMA was pretty much, I mean, I hate to say it like this, but it's true. It's just where, where people cleaned money. Would yeah, you agree it with wasn't that? a prosperous sport. It wasn't, no. it was still frowned upon as partially you know, human cockfighting and it was like, uh, you know, it, it, nobody, nobody liked it. I mean, Chris knows. Chris, Chris fought in that day. I mean, Man, when, when, we when fought you told for people, When you told people you fought in the cage, they looked at you like you uh, said you ate babies for breakfast or something. They kind of yeah, go, oh, exactly. they kind of step away and try and distance themselves. And like, it wasn't accepted at all, you know? So it definitely wasn't revered. It was re- like people like us liked it, you know, like the hardcore fans, but... There wasn't a lot of them, and uh, yeah, most people thought you were a nut, and, and it wasn't well respected. So, like you're saying, if you fought for money, then you weren't very good at math, or you weren't smart. <laughs> you don't understand there wasn't money around. You know what I mean? So you fought. For, it was kind of cool in some ways because you didn't have any fake. You have a lot of fake people out there. People were like, if they if they trained a lot and fought, it's because they loved it. There wasn't anybody who was like, I just do this for the money. Well, then you're not smart because there's no, not a lot of money. And it was just it was hardcore fans and hardcore fighters. That was it. And you know, you know the thing about back in that day too is the the sport was not understood. No. So it was it was it was in a way it was like barbaric because it wasn't understood. So 
I take my hat off to guys, you know, I'm, I'm not propping myself, but I'm taking my hat off to all the fighters that fought back in that day because those were true martial artists and warriors because you're going into something that seems barbaric and it's not understood. So we, the people who fought in that day were people who had that freaking grit, had that courage, had that heart, and that, that desire to push themselves and challenge themselves. Very different from today. Now, what I will say, what, that is one thing I used to love about fighting in Japan. I feel like the crowd was more educated there than any place else in the world I've been. They yeah, understood 100%. it. But the pain, you know, so it was a little different. Um, so I did love fighting over there. But what you're saying right now is the reason the, that attitude that we we're talking about, that you were talking about, is the same reason I love being involved with the bare knuckle fights and the bare knuckle fight at BKFC right now is because that's awesome. Bare knuckle, when I, man. when I talk to MMA fighters, like some of them, their eyes light up and they want to do the bare knuckle. But I'm like, you're a real fighter. You know, if there's guys like, I'm yeah. not doing that. Like, I'm like, yeah, because you're an athlete and you, this is an athletic contest. You, it's not a fight. I want the fighters. I want the people who want to come out there and punch and get punched and bleed. I, those are the real fighters to me. So that's what that, as what MMA used to be 20 years ago, in my opinion. That's why I love the bare knuckle. I love doing it. I love commentating it because that's it's the same attitude that we used to have. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's awesome. I like that too, man. Yeah. So, so Ensign, he signs a quarter million dollar year contract. Where is his family at with this news? The, fa the father's still against it. He just so refuses I, I, to admit he's wrong. As you know, Murahama's fight, um, we, we, we knew he was going to be outclassed. We just felt that kid had the power. We know his stamina was real skeptical, but uh, we know he had the power to knock him out. And we, I just, we we're just going to go in there and take our chances and try and knock him out. And the whole plan was that if he, uh, if he gets into any type of trouble, that starts getting tired or starts getting too outclassed, he was going to pick him up and throw him out of the ring. <laughs> yeah, have a plan B. I like it. Yeah. I mean, if you can't go out the front door, go out the back. It's the yeah, so it was about, you know, if you're going to, you're going to lose, get DQ. Throw right. him out yeah. of the ring, get DQ. I like it. Well, like and, and Kid was also kind of creating an image for himself as the bad boy as well at this point. Well, I should say it started way before this. Well, that wouldn't that wasn't too much out of his character. He was game to do that. So and as a coach, I was ready to take on any repercussions that come from it. You know, like if they had problems, his Yakuza sponsors got mad because we did that to their fighter. You know, I was willing to stand in front of the kid for him. So, you know, it wasn't a it wasn't a big dilemma. We decided, okay, that's what we'll do. Lo and behold, fucking kid knocks him out. <laughs> Plan A. Yeah, it's, it's Tony Valente from Team Cobra. That was the, uh, oh no, that was a 50. W which fight are you talking about? Okay, before we go on, there's a little bit of two insights that I need to tell you about the Murahama fight. Okay, go ahead. One, he could have continued in the match, but he was too tired. It was a tournament. Okay. Okay. It was a tournament. He, was, he could have continued, but he was blown and... I, as a coach, as a as a PR guy for him, felt that he beat Murahama. There's no more you can gain from this. So yeah. we decided to. Um, he did hurt, you know. He did. Uh, he did hurt his hand a little bit, but he was. It wasn't enough to stop the fight. But we decided to step out of the tournament, claiming hand injury, because I think he he gained so much from that win. So we did, he got, you know, a lot of fame and, and fortune from that because he got a lot of sponsors from that. Um, got a call two days later from K1. He failed his drug test. Marijuana? positive for marijuana. Wow. The devil's so lettuce. <laughs> if, that, if, that, if that came public, that would have shut down his whole career. Really? And, he, and he's there like would a have Japanese been Japanese Diaz brother. That's what he is. <laughs> yeah. So what I did was I made a phone call to K1. I called called Tanigawa and let him know, let him know in a real straight up way that I would really be unhappy if he if he uh made that that positive test public. 
And I think he understood man. because that never came out until, you know, I'm talking wow. about it today, but That's nobody knows about it. That's a good manager role right there. Great job as a manager, man. You got to talk, call him and let him know what's up. You know, that's in his best interest. You're, but everybody's, it's in everybody's best interest. What's the point of it? And, and yeah. just to clean up a little bit of a, about what Ensign was saying there, this is uh, the Murahama fight was the first one he had for K1. The, he, in, in this big contract you got, it seems like he got some matches in, under kickboxing and also K1 was doing MMA. So he got some matches under MMA rules and he could switch back and forth. But this was his very first fight. It would have derailed everything. Yeah, well, so he fought Murahama, and then the next time they wanted him to fight, they wanted him to fight K1 rules again. And I felt that he got lucky in Murahama, and I don't <laughs> think it, I didn't think it was a good idea for him to fight K1 rules. So I believe his next fight might have been Yasuhiro. You know, his next fight that I have is Tony Valente. And, and, I, and keep in mind, I only have his MMA bouts. I think I've got one or two of his kickboxing. I, I just figured we'd focus on this, but... Please, by all means, interrupt with, with the so what, kickboxing. So what stuff. happened with that whole K-1, whether it was a Valente or Yasuhiro, what happened with that K-1 contract is I got in touch with uh, Kanigawa, had a meeting with him and said that um, I negotiated for kids, something that's never been done in K-1 and will never, ever be done in K-1 again. I negotiated where we have split rules in the fight because I knew that kid could not beat Yasuhiro in a K-1 match. So... I told Kanigawa that I need the rules to be changed to first round. We can do first round kickboxing, but second round has to be MMA. Yasuhiro <clears throat> was the next one after Valente, for the record. Okay, yeah. yeah so yeah. all those fights, it was he wasn't a striker, so we had to have a half and half rule. So with Yasuhiro, was there any negotiating or did they just agree right away? They agreed right away because they felt that they could take him on in the first round in kickboxing. I have a question real quick. So fast. I got a question real quick. Like, after the fail for marijuana, I mean, are you having a talk with him? Like, hey, man, you got to stop this like a couple of weeks in advance. Or you got to, we got to <laughs> make sure this isn't a problem, you know, because you're going to get popped again if you don't be careful. You have to change it up. Did that conversation happen or he just kind of figured it out or what? Yeah, well, well, by then, by then I, I knew he loved marijuana and <laughs> I, I was more on, you got to be fucking smart. You got to stop yeah. smoking before fights. You got to, at least a yeah. couple months before the fight, you stop smoking, period. Okay. Well, yeah. and that being said, when you, when you stop that, that test from coming out was a beautiful idea. But to me, it's not like, it's not like he's taking, so it's, this isn't a performance enhancing drug. What's it matter if you're taking it? You know what I mean? So it's not like he's doing anything Ill, wrong, in my opinion. He's, well, what does that hurt? Well, it's not in poor performance. It's not like he's on steroids, so. Go right ahead. I just thought that was good that you got rid of that. And there's no reason, reason to test for marijuana, in my opinion. It doesn't help. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with you 100%. <laughs> and Mike, Mike's talking about the Valente fight and now the, the Yasuhiro fight. This is part of the Max tournament. I mean, K1 really needed him because up until this point, they are really a kickboxing company. And now they're coming into MMA and he's becoming a star in MMA with them in this tournament and stuff. So talk about how big K1 was and how, but they risked something coming over to MMA. They needed it. Well, K1 really didn't start that move into MMA, MMA yet. They, I think they fed off of Kid's popularity. Mm -hmm. And at, after the Yasuhiro fight, I think Kid wasn't like super huge yet. He was, he was a buzz now. He was a buzz. The fight that actually took him into that status of a superstar was when he beat Naranton, the Mongolian fighter. Well, okay. that's that's the next one. So you're talking about Tunaga. I get the mind. The greatest Mongolian fighter ever is Tunaga Jaba Maba. Dude, I've never. <laughs> oh, I guarantee. Yeah, listen, dude. I, I just I just said a whole bunch of letters <laughs> together. Uh, Tunaga obviously is his nickname. That is the name of his gym, also. He ended his career at 14 and five. And I mean, there's a big Mongolian culture in Japan as well. Some of the greatest conquerors this planet has ever seen. Yeah. So after he beat the Mongolian fighter, that's when it blew up. And that's when like it was. He knocked him out in a minute 55. Yeah. And 
what happened after that is uh, this is where the father starts stepping in. All of a sudden, the father sees him become a superstar, and the father wants a part of it. Ugh. What do you mean a part of it? He wants to control his career. Oh. <laughs> kind of so, like... <laughs> so without me knowing, without me knowing, kid talks to the father, and they plan without me knowing for him to call out Masato after that fight. It was kind of a backstab for me, not because they didn't let me know what they were doing. I'm close. I was really close with Masato's uh, mentor and manager, Haru. And I got a call directly the next night after from Haru saying, hey, Ensign, what is going on? Why didn't you tell me? And I'm like, Haru, believe it or not, I didn't know about it. And he's like, bullshit. I said, I didn't know about it. Wow. So, well, Ensign, Ensign, I'm going to be honest with you. You're, you're not a guy that gets surprised by a lot of things. I would also have trouble believing you, even though I have no doubt you're telling the truth, but you, you're not a guy that gets surprised. <laughs> yeah. Do agree so, on that? Yeah. So I was like, for me, I didn't feel like he was ready for Masato. I felt well, that. I felt that he should have maybe built himself a couple more fights before Masato. Why not? So if he brought that to me, I would have told him, let's wait a couple more fights. But I think that Mongolian fight was right before the New Year. So the New Year, as you know, in Japan, they have huge New Year shows. It's kind of like the, uh, was it the Cinco de Mayo weekend? You know, there's always <laughs> a Hispanic boxer, like a lot of notoriety with that. Japan, it's always December 31st. Yes. Yes. And, yes. and the father had this big plan of renegotiating the contract with K1. Okay. Oh, went behind no. my back. Went behind my back and told K1 that if they don't renegotiate the contract, kid's not fighting for him anymore. Wow. Now, there's wow. a problem with that. There's a problem with that. The problem with that is... Um, you're going to have to, uh, there's going to be a fringeman, a contract, breach a contract that kid's going to get hit for. So oh. I told him that, the told them that we can't do that. There's a breach of contract. And besides that, I want to honor my word. Yeah. Yeah. You mean it was so an that, amazing contract when you signed it more than you ever would have wanted. Now you're asking for more. Well, the thing with the thing with that whole contract is both of us are making a gamble. Both me and us and K1 were making a gamble because if Nor Kid lost his first three fights and became a nobody, they still had to pay him. I would hold them responsible for four fights a year at fifty thousand a fight. Yeah, and vice versa. If Kid became a superstar and could possibly negotiate a track to ten times more of money, we were going to honor our word and stay in that two-year contract and they renegotiate after two years. So mm -hmm. I was totally against that. So, so what happened with that is the dad, um, the dad decides to, uh, it, you know, it's kind of interesting that you guys are asking me about this because nobody knows all of this stuff. This is like a lot of guys like Barrett Yoshida, you know, there's a lot of guys that are still, were, were, until his death was really close to kid. I never told them this story. Barrett's my little brother. Barrett's loyal to me to death. And if I told Barrett everything that happened, he'd probably back off from kid. But I didn't say anything. I didn't want to interrupt some relationship. So <clears throat> I kept it quiet. But what happened then was they decide to get this guy that was a part of, have you ever heard of Ultraman? It's like a superhero character in Japan, but he okay. was a yeah. big person behind Ultraman. He had a lot of pull in the, the talent agencies. They have him contact me with a contract. I still have the contract. The contract has not been public until I'm going to be putting it in my second book. Cool. The contract literally writes and says that we are now going to break ties with Ensign. We're going to be done with Ensign. And if there is any infringement on any law, any contract, Ensign will take full responsibility. Yikes. Wow. So this guy, I mean, this, 
the Zai Kazama Ken comes with me with this contract, and in Japan, a signature is a stamp, a hanku stamp. He comes with me with three hankus on the paper. Kid's hanku, the father's hanku, and Kazama Ken's hanku. They present the contract to me in the meeting, and I look at the contract. It's all in kanji. I can't read it. So I told him, hey, you know what? I'm going to take a look at this, and I'll, I'll, I'll we'll talk about it later. He goes, he wants me to sign it now. I said, no. I said, I'm going to read it. As soon as I got up to take the contract, he tries to snatch it out of my hand. And that's when I knew there was something to hide in there. Oh, yeah. So I Did grabbed give that it to contract, him or take, I, yeah. I folded it up, I put it in my pocket, I said, you're not getting the contract back. Brought the contract to one of my gangster friends. He read the contract, reacted on his own, called Kid and called Kid out to a street fight. He said, what Kid just did to you is he backstabbed you. I called Kid, asked him about the country. He said he knew nothing about it. So I called the gangster guy, told him, you owe Kid an apology. Had them meet, they squashed it. And next day I get a call from K1 that the father and Kazama Ken are at their office negotiating a $4 million contract for him to fight, continue fighting in K1. Mm -hmm. I call Kid who's in Thailand. I, I send him to Thailand to train. I call Kid in Thailand and say, hey, what's going on with your dad? He knew about it, didn't tell me about it. And he said, oh, my dad said I can make $2 million if I fight Masato. See what the dad's doing? The dad yeah. didn't yeah. for negotiating for four million. He Keep tells two for himself. two million. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable. And like, let me put this in perspective. The, the Masato wow. fight happened December 31st, 2004 on what they call K-1 Dynamite, which is a major show. And like to give American fans perspective, I believe it ran head-to-head -head against Pride where Pride had like Yoshida against Rulon Gardner. Shockwaves. Yeah. Fedor and Noguera, you know, Krokop and Mark Hunt. Like it was one of the all time great Pride shows right here. So even $2 million and $4 million, the big companies were making a, a fortune at this point off of these fighters already. Yeah. So yeah, how I, does that get resolved between you and his father? Um, so what happened was, is I told, I talked to the father, I met with the father. I told him, Hey, you want to negotiate stuff? Don't touch the contract. Don't touch his opponents. And the father expressed to me that he can, he, with Kazama Ken, he can get kid commercials and big thing, big, big sponsorship. And I told him by all means, if you can get him stuff that I can't get, let's do it. But I said, as far as the fight career, I've started controlling it. I want to make sure, one, I control his opponents. Two, I want to make sure that I honor my word. They agreed with me. One this is later, a very this is a very soft approach for yourself, I might add. Like this well, is a mature, father. It's his yeah, father. Yeah, I can't this grab is him a, and beat him up. This is a very mature incident anyway. Like more mature, I think, than we've had in both interviews, by the way. Well, well, you know what it is, yeah. It's his father, and it's the father of my wife. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. How can, how can you not act like that? No, I, I, I think, mean, if, I if think it was what, anybody else, he'd be in a van in an un, un, unmarked location. Fearing you'd, be making jewelry, you'd be making jewelry with their bones, because Ensign, for everybody out there, does jewelry. He does, uh, you do, um, yes, there we go. What, what are we calling those, Ensign? It's a, a parcel bracelets. So parcel bracelets with stones. You you do them yourself, and you've got several stores throughout Hawaii and Japan. Where can people buy those? And send anybody that's listening up until this point, you're at the edge of your seat. If you got some extra money, where can they yeah. go and get them? Destinyforever.com. One more time. Destinyforever in one word dot com. Destinyforever.com. Because Ensign. This is crazy shit, man. Okay, so you're I have a mature. question here, real quick, real quick. With 
what is K1 saying about this, about these people showing up and asking for four million are like, get the hell out of here. Are they talking to them or are they talking to you and be like, get control of this shit. What are they saying? That's an awesome question. I got a call from K1 because they're panicking. They're saying that what's going on. And so we had an agreement and I told K1, as far as I'm concerned, we're honoring the agreement. So I call kid's father, okay. tell him to step back and he just sees money. I call kid and I tell kid, hey kid, stop your father, man. And I told kid that if you can't control your father, I can't work with your father. So you're gonna have to pick your father or your or me. And little dude I need to say is uh I wasn't in the corner for his Masato fight, and since that fight, I was never ever in his corner again. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. Did this, did this end your relationship with his sister? Um, no, um, I already, um, at that time, I think uh, I already, oh, right after that happened, I mean, no, before that happened, I divorced the sister. You think this was his payback to you over that? No, not at all, because after I divorced his sister, we were still tight. We were still he didn't care about that. He was me and him were like little brothers. We were brothers. How was your relationship with his sister after the divorce? Um, very bad. She didn't okay. let me. She had a son from a previous marriage that everyone thinks is my son, but it's not my son. I just raised him with all my heart and as my son for four years. That's cool. She didn't let me see him, so that kind of tore us apart. <laughs> so, kid. So what happened moving forward is um, when that happened, a uh, kid chose his father. I stepped back. Um, you, as you guys know, I groomed him from zero. He has the biggest fight of his life. I mean, you know, you bring your, you bring your football team to the Super Bowl. You want to be there. But I had to step back because, um, because they, they, he chose the father and I stepped back, you know. So... How big um, was that fight? Huge. It was huge. I, I still don't know what, what he got paid for it, but I heard they negotiate a, a much bigger contract, which, you know, great for him. So what, what happens with that is I call K1 and I tell K1, um, our agreement still stands. Every time he fights, whether you renegotiate, you renegotiate the contract, our our. I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys do what you guys want. So they wanted, they actually wanted to have kid, even if they had to renegotiate. Unless I held them responsible, but I stepped back and I said, do what you guys need to do. What's ever best for you guys and kid, I'll step back. And I did step back, but I made sure that they understood that I still want to hold them tight to the agreement that every time kid fights, I get 10 grand. Yeah. <laughs> So you might after, as well. I mean, you know, you never got anything off a of kid. You might as well. Yeah. After his first fight yeah. with Masato, nothing from K1. Wow. So I called K1 and I said, what's going on? You guys got to transfer the money to me. And they said, well, Ensign, I thought you knew. One of his uh, negotiating powers to getting a better contract is that he was going to take care of the 10 grand for them. Wow. <laughs> So kid's a huge star now. He's uh, buying, uh, he had like two different cars. I know he bought a Hummer and he bought like, uh, shit, he had like a couple of nice new cars. So I called kid, met him downstairs from the gym I opened for him. And I said, hey, they said you're supposed to pay me the money. He gave me a story about how his not having his, financially having a hard time meeting ends. And I know he was living in an apartment that cost him 20000 a month. Ugh. And that's when I knew that um, the loyalty was never there with him. So I, that's when I pretty much stood back. Didn't hate the guy, but I, you know, of course, it's, it's my protege. It's someone that I raised, and I'm always hoping that he has the best in his career. So I, I've always watched his fights and always hoped that he did, he did good. But he stayed, he stayed at that sister gym of yours, though, correct? Yeah, well, what happened with that was... Uh, that gym that I opened for him, the Killer Bee, it was called Killer Bee at the time. Yeah, Killer Bee. It was yeah. run by a it was run by a yakuza guy that I had him, you know, take care of kid. And 
because Kid became such a superstar, him and Kid got like this and they started going doing stuff behind my back. Man. And that's, and as we, I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but as we know, that's the first Yakuza that I gave a beating. <laughs> Would you mind refreshing everybody's? Uh, and that you, you did mention it in your other interview, but if, if you wouldn't mind, because it all kind of fits into the timeline. Yeah. Well, um, what happened then was, uh, you know, I always watch kids. Uh, I watch kids fights. I watched it on TV. I always wanted to see how well he did because it was one of the guys that I brought up. And when I uh, watched the fight that he, he won the K1, the MMA, the heroes tournament, when he beat, uh, I think he beat Genki Sudo in the finals. He beat Genki Sudo and it was, like it was kind of a, a crazy route up there. Let me let me just kind of recap it. Um, the K1 heroes to even get into the Grand Prix, the opening round was Ian Shafa. Ian oh, is yeah. Ian has kind of got like a gangster image. I shouldn't say kind of. He is absolutely a gangster from Australia. If you listen to our Brian Eversall interview, he, he talks about he's a real famous guy for street fighting. So he gets into the uh, the heroes tournament where his first opponent, Hoyler Gracie, obviously. I mean, if you're listening to this podcast, you know who he is. Multiple-time ADCC winner. Um, Cal Uno beats Cal Uno in the second round. And then he winds up with Genki Sudo in the finals on a December 31st, 2005. Those are one of the greatest tournament runs in the 155-pound weight class with a guy that later fights at 125. Yeah. So... I'm at, I'm at home watching. I'm sitting right on this couch right here watching the fight in this exact living room watching the fight. Got some of my friends over saying, okay, after the fight, we'll go we'll drive to a, the town next and have some drinks, you know, at the host's clubs and everything. Okay, yeah, let, let, let's watch this fight and go have fun, you know. We watched the fight and uh, the, the Yakuza guy that um, kind of turned his back on me, he was on the run from me. I would call him. He would avoid my calls. I would pop in the gym. He would never be there. He would avoid me, avoid the gym. This guy is in the ring hugging kid after the victory. If you watch that video, and we have played that video, I could point him out in the <laughs> crowd hugging kid in the ring. And I'm sitting there ready to go drink at some hostess clubs and looking at him and says, this motherfucker, he has the nerve to run from me but he's actually going in national tv mm. and hugging kid it's like a slap in my face so i call my friends that were supposed to meet at the host clubs i said we're not coming they asked me why and i said because i gotta take care of my shit the now the now guys this guy like, this guy owes you money like he's supposed to be paying rent for using your gym am i correct no, I collected no money from him. He paid me $20,000 to use Purebred as a name. And I never connect, collected any any uh, royalties, any residuals. All I asked him was to do the proper thing and raise kid right and take care of kid. What was kid doing that was uh, of concern to yourself outside of the, outside of the ring? Well, the marijuana thing. You know, it was being really, it was notorious about that, about being smoking marijuana. The, the Yakuza guy really loved marijuana also, so I knew he was a part of it. I actually had a meeting with him once, uh, gave him a little scoldings. He promised to straighten things up, never did. So that's when I started trying to find him. And that's when I saw him in the ring. So what I did was I called my, I called, canceled the, the, the outing. Had a couple of my students find out where the after party was, and I went down to find the that guy in the after party. What happened wow. when you found him? Did he see you? Well, we dragged him out of the party into a park next door, and he had a 20-minute beating. <laughs> I love it. He didn't see a thing, oddly enough. <laughs> yeah, so, Man. you know, so, you know, Right there, it was um, it, it was uh, the 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 relationship between me and Kid was severed. Well, well how, how did was Kid at this party? Yes, he was. I was gonna drag him out with the Yakuza and beat both of them up. 
Did Kid try but, to stop this, or did he just? Uh, okay, like, so when when they went in, my students went into the club. I went into the party to grab. Um, uh, his name is Ag. He's a yakuza guy. When they, they went to grab Ag out, he freaked out. Kid freaked out. Say, what's going on? What's going on? And they said that Ensign wants to talk to Ag. They knew I wasn't happy. Kid knew what I was going to do to him. But kid never came out. Never but it's came what out. it is. It is what he it knew, is. He, he knew what was happening and he didn't come out. So what, what happened with that is kid was going to be next. I was going to pull kid back out to the park <laughs> next and he was going to get a beating next. But what happened after that is because the guys that I was supposed to meet in the, for the drinking was a Chinese mafia. They got scared that I was going to do something stupid. And the underworld grapevine went wild. I had another Yakuza from down south come down to try and beg me to stop. Uh, I had, um, and the word came out that his higher ups found out what I was doing. And what happened with that in the middle of the beating, they came through the bushes. <laughs> and and it almost got bigger. Um, I just found out like a couple a couple years ago that they actually had knives with them, machetes with them. Yeah. Wow. Um, Japan, three guys Japan. came out. They came into the park. They were pissed off. They, I my the Chinese guys came up and confronted them, stopped them, and I told the guys to let them let them through, man. And if they, you know, I beat up your guy if you. If you guys want to, if, if, if it's going to go down, I mean, hey, I'll take responsibility. It'll, it'll go down. Just do it. But I told the, the top guy, Hasegawa, that I actually got a call from Hasegawa yesterday. But anyway, the top guy, Hasegawa, tells me, look what you did. You can't do that to the Yakuza. You have to pay a price. And I said, uh, I said, Yakuza, no Yakuza. I said, I want to ask you one question. And he said, what? I said, if somebody backstabs you, and you only did 20% of what you wanted to do. Wouldn't you think that's fair? And he looked at me and he said, look at AG. He was bleeding. He was standing, but he was bleeding. And I, he said, look at him. What can, he can't work for a month now. Look what you did to him. And I said, well, I said, I've been hitting him for 20 minutes. <laughs> and I told him, if I really wanted to hurt him, what do you think would have happened in 20 minutes? <laughs> you know, I, I think I asked him straight up. I said, if I wanted to kill AG, how soon you, how fast do you think I could kill AJ? And he straight up looked at me and I said, look at him, 20%, dude. And his whole demeanor changed. And he said, oh man, he said, thank you. Thank you, but can you not do any more? And I said, I said, you know, I, I felt, I felt in a way that it's not his side to say if I can do more or not. But he said a line that, that sticks with me now. And he said that if AJ doesn't, straighten this up I'll kill him myself okay. so that was enough for me to step back mm. and I you know from there it, it pretty much was uh, kid was more someone that I said I cheered for him from the background but I said hi and bye when we went through the <clears throat> we saw each other at the events was hi and bye we never hung out we never got together and was he embarrassed I don't know. I've never had a. I've never had the word for him. I never got to talk to him about it. We never did squash this face to face. Now that that has to be, you know, painful to you. I mean, the fact to look at this this whole exchange of energy there, he'd just be Hoyler Gracie, Kyle Uno, and Genki Sudo, Gracie and Uno in the same day. This is the point where he was the number one guy. You know, and you're not there anymore. So at the end of the day, you get through the Yakuza stuff, but you got to go home and feel hurt. Um, at that point right there, you know, as though as well, he was doing didn't bother me. I wasn't like I wanted to be a part of that fame. I just what, what really hurt me, if you want to talk about hurt, what really hurt me was that. As you guys probably know, a lot of the new people now in fighting, 
don't know who I am. They don't know. They know kid, but they don't know who I am. So apparently he hasn't mentioned my name, hasn't mentioned what I did for him. So I was, I mean, you guys know because you guys are old school. But if you go through someone in Japan right now and you say, hey, you know, you remember Kid Yamamoto. Most people will know Kid Yamamoto. And they look at them and say, you know, Ensign Inouye. And if they're not a fight fan, they'll be like, Ensign Inouye, no, we don't know Ensign Inouye. And they're like, oh, that was Kid Yamamoto's coach. And they're like, whoa, really? Hmm. Well, it happens all the time. Let so me if ask anything you. hurt, that hurt that he cut me out of the picture. Do, do you Did think it's do, do you think it might be because they see you as a foreigner? No, that had nothing to do with it. It was just about um some of your Hawaii they, native, I mean Japan transplant. No, I think the Japanese took me in as their own. It was just kid them severed their some themselves from me. And, you know, the real funny thing about that is um, I, we, we had like a whole big uh, incident happen in the, um, at his farewell party too, yeah? Well, what, do you, you want to go over what happened there? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so he, when he passed, okay, the, to, to back up a little bit, I knew nothing about his cancer. I wasn't informed. Oh, nobody I, did. Nobody I, did. Nobody did. No, not nobody. Yeah. There's a lot of people who knew because he went to my students in Guam. He loved <laughs> Guams. He went to them. He con confided in them. They knew about it. And for some reason, he didn't want me to know. Um. So, it, you know, uh, for me... I always felt that there was one day me and kid would be able to sit down and squash this whole thing. And if we didn't squash it, where we became really close again, at least we could, I could let them know that, Hey kid, I never hated you, man. I always loved like a little brother. I always cheered from you from afar. And I wish you the best. You know, I mean, that is something that I would have loved to have had a conversation with. And what happened in that whole thing was, I got a call from a guy in Guam saying, hey, kid's sick. And I'm like, what do you mean? He came in to cut hair today, but he's uh, really skinny. And I'm like, ah, oh, he, he did look kind of skinny. Hindsight, he did look kind of skinny, you know. But I didn't think anything. No, nah, it can't be anything. No, it can't be anything. Um, there's a picture that comes out in the gossip magazines in Japan that shows him. And he's really skinny. That there's some kind of rumor that he's sick. Okay. So I find out that he has cancer. And what I also found out later was all the, a lot of my, the, my students in Guam knew about it. No, and they kept, they kept it, they kept it from me. You know, a lot of, you know, one of the guys that I talked to says he, you know, he didn't want to break his, uh, his promise to a dying man. But, you know, for me, I feel like the loyalty is between me and them. You know, the, I mean, if anything, I took care of these guys from day one, these, these guys in Guam, you know, I, um, they're like my little brothers. I would have died for them. I helped them with their companies. I helped them with everything they did, you know, and I introduced them to kid and they became close to kid. When me and kid had the falling out, I didn't tell them don't be friends with kid. I let them flow with their friendship. They kept the friendship. I mean, to be honest, I was a little bit sad that, you know, they knew I had a falling out with kid and they didn't make the choice to pull away. But I wasn't going to be the person like a little bitch telling them don't don't like him because I don't like him, you know. So, yeah, you know, I did. I just let it let it flow. And the fact that they decided to keep a secret from me, something that I feel I should have known. And if wow. kid wanted a secret, they should have trusted me that to tell me that, hey, Ensign, don't tell kid. But you need to know this. We, you, just, you, just, you raise him. He's like your little brother. You need to know this. And then oh, I, I would have I kept, kept the promise. I would have kept the agreement. I would have not told anything, but I would have thanked them. So, yeah, even a phone call, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. so what, what, I, what I realized with that said, what I realized in my life is that I run a strict hard code of loyalty. 
that if you're going to be a brother to me, you need to have for me and I have for you. I die for you tomorrow. And because they didn't have that type of loyalty to me, it doesn't make them bad. It just doesn't make them special. That's so, a good way to put it, man. I like that. I, I can't hold them as bad person or, or, or tell I fucking, you guys are disloyal. No, no, no. They have normal loyalty. For me, I don't have normal loyalty. My loyalty is 100% or zero. There's no such thing as being loyal sometimes or being loyal on certain things. You're either 100% loyal or not loyal at all. And I love that the uh, that Dave Feldman, when I've been to his office, he has something that says, you can't be 99% loyal. There is no such thing. You can't be, it's all or nothing, man. And that's exactly what you're saying. I love that. I've seen it. You can't be 99% loyal. You're either loyal or you're not. That's that's just what you're saying right there. I, and I agree with that, man. That's great. Yeah, 100%. I, 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 so so um, I've uh, distanced myself from them. So well, that that actually to... that actually affected the the friendship that I had um, in Guam also. So you know, I mean, when they see this, they're gonna realize. I mean, I think they already know that I've 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 distanced myself a little bit because, you know, I don't know about you guys, but the older you get, I think the tighter and stronger your circle gets. And the reason being is because the the older you get, the more experience you have with uh, the people. And the more times you these people can show of their their the the strength of their loyalty, and they can also show whether they also are really loyal or not. So my you know, my circle got smaller, but my circle it is a lot stronger. And so so um, you know, what, real quick, I just love what you're saying, man. Sometimes I notice, like, I love it when like negative shit happens in my life because. When everything's great, it's everybody's your friend. But when negative things happen, then you really find out who's really there and who's not. You know, so I don't mind that when, when you see these 10 people are still here, those are my 10 people. When there was a hundred, now there's 10. Now you're my those other people might be here and there, but you're never gonna be in my inner circle, like you're saying. So you see who's really there for you when things aren't perfect. But that's the way I see it. Yeah. So so you know, I mean that happened um and i was uh you know what what people don't know is i had an inside from some from someone that was at the hospice i actually i actually was able to get a letter to kid oh wow i got a letter to him telling him that you know i love you as a little brother i hear what happened I pray for you and I just wanted to let you know that I always uh, I always saw you as my little brother. So they got him to read that letter and uh, the what, what I understood, what they told me was when he got the letter, he read it and he cried. Never got to talk to him. Next thing I knew is uh, he, he I heard he passed. Uh, he made the announcement that he was sick, and less than a month later, he had passed. Yeah, like and then, it was. Uh, I think it was. Was it stomach cancer? Yeah, it was stomach cancer. Yeah. And so they have a. Um, the first word I got was that kid wanted to be buried in Guam. He loved Guam, and there was one of my ex students that took care of him. This guy Melker. Melker, he was yeah. like a brother to. He was like Melker Manibusin. He was like a brother to kid, so he took care of kid. They I died mean, in uh, kid died in his arms on his couch. Yeah, I mean Melker was there with kid like every day, massaging him. Melker cleaning him I up, mean, everything. Yeah. Melk, for me, man, you know, my I, I I believe that you know some people say that oh wow, you Melker was your friend and he turned his back towards kid. No, but I feel that the reason why I introduced the universe had me introduce kid to Melker was because Melker was going to take care of Kid in his last days. And I I am 100% forever grateful for Melker taking care of Kid like that. Well, why, why don't we kind of bring it back just a little bit to kind of show what type of relationship, like how strong that bond was between you two. And um, you had a fight, where is it at? Yes. You had a fight against Daniel Viani, um, April 16, 2004, at Super Bowl 25. 
Oh, no, no. I apologize. I'm uh, sorry. Dan- Daniel Viani was the referee. You had Tom- yeah, Tommy Sauer was the uh, the opponent. Um, why don't you bring us through that fight when you when you went up against Tommy Trauma? Um, Tommy, uh, yeah, when I fought Tommy, I was already pretty much uh, done with fighting, but I wanted to just uh, before I actually put up the gloves away, I wanted to fight in my two homes that I considered homes was Guam and Hawaii. So I, as you know, I wanted to. I know Tommy Sar was a good striker, so I wanted to strike stand stand with him. But I guess I was I was already changing as a fighter, and I clinched, tried to take him down. You know, I ended up uh, underneath him, got hit a little bit, but not nothing to be worried about. And the you know the referee stopped the fight, and I didn't protest because you don't know what it looked like. I, I've learned not to protest until after you watch the fight. Even the Heath hearing fight, when when it was stopped, I didn't protest it because I didn't know what it looked like. If it looked real bad, and then I'm I'm complaining that the referees, I, I look like a stupid person. So I didn't <laughs> protest it, but I I remember kid just going nuts, like almost Baroni. wanting to start a start a fight with the ref. Yeah. Okay, let me tell you something. Phil Baroni was oh, Phil like. Too. Phil Baroni and Kid Yamamoto were in Ensign's corner, and Baroni was the voice of reason. Think about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh shit, that's right. You don't uh, hear that often. You don't hear yeah, that. Yeah. Yamamoto wasn't letting Viani out of the ring, wasn't letting Viani out of the corner. I don't know. I don't know what it took for Yamamoto not to beat up the referee. But there, there was, you know, the gods of war stopped it from happening, but it was on its way. And had he done that, he wouldn't have been able to fight in that 2005 Grand Prix, you know, where, you know, he cut his bones, essentially. Yeah, so what happened with Kid is after he passed, um, my gym got an invitation for, uh, for him to go to, for them to go to his funeral. Um. I got a call like three days before because I was planning to go anyway to pay my respects to him. Of course. Like, yeah. So I got a call from his manager and they called me and told me that they're going to be having two parties. They're going to be one for famous people, press, gyms. The second gathering is going to be in the afternoon and it's going to be for fans. They... After they send an invitation for the people, the, the people that run my gym to go to the first party, they call me personally and say, can you please come to the second party? Oh, wow. So they want me to go with the fans. <laughs> so, so I'm like, okay. Was this his father? Fucked up. Uh, yeah, probably the father. And maybe I, I'm not sure if it was me or not the, my ex-wife. Okay. The That's word. Fair. The word I get is she didn't want to see me. So, you know, understandable. Okay. You know, I felt, you know, put your grudges aside, man. Your, your brother just freaking died, man. Put yeah. your grudge, wow. put all our grudges aside. I mean, as just for anything, I got backstabbed by the dad. Mew never let me see her son. You know, I mean, for if anything, I'm the one who don't want to see them, but I was willing to throw that all out the window. And I was willing to go in there and pay my respects. So I get that call. So I call all the people around me, my gyms. And I tell them, you guys are coming with me. We're going to unite and we're all going to go together in the second party. The, the people, okay, apparently the father didn't put any money out for the, for the funeral. The oh. sponsors did. The sponsors put all the money out. The sponsors get word of it. They call me and say, Ensign, what's going on? You have to come to the first party because it's going to look really weird that you're not allowed to come to the first party. And these guys, these sponsors are uh, like Yakuza guys. yeah. So I tell them, I already made all my calls. All my guys are all going to meet me on the second party. And I tell them, I was told that I can't come to the first party. They said, no, we're going to waive it. You can come. In fact, if you don't come, 
if you don't come, it's gonna we're gonna lose face because you it's gonna look bad on us because we're we're the ones who are organizing this. And I and I, I looked, I told him on the phone. I said, you know what? I said you guys should have fucking took care of that before. So I said, I'm going to the second party. I'm going to the second session. Yeah. So they said, oh, they they had they they. I mean, they can't make me do anything. So I I I did. The funny thing is, the big reason why they wanted me to come to the second part is because apparently Mio didn't want to see me. I get there, walk in there, I get escorted in. I, I was I I I thank them for not making me line up with all the fans, which was a huge line around the corner. They escorted me in, and me and my maybe like thirty people, my group in, through the side. And as I'm walking through the side, I see me who's still there taking picture with fans. And I'm like, if she didn't want to see me that bad, why is she still here? The, the, first, the, first, the first session ended like a couple hours before that. So I go in there. There's this huge, uh, this, this powerful um, underworld guy that's Yakuza, not Yakuza, but he has power with um, production agencies. He has, uh, he's the one of the backing for Rising, you know. I mean, he's one of those big guys that backs up a lot of association. I knew him a long time. I saw him as soon as he got there. I was like, hey, long time we'll see. Shake his hand, everything. Go to Light Incense. See him there again. Oh, he's by me again. He's following me around the freaking thing. So I, um, I light my incense, pay my respects, and I'm about, I'm about to leave. The manager of Kid, the guy who asked me to come to the second party, comes up to me and says, Ensign, we put up a, a, a collaboration video of Kid's life and career. Can you please sit down and watch it? I'm like, okay, I'll come and watch it. So I went into that separate room where all the other, some fans were already gathering, and I sat down and started watching the video. They covered his youth. They covered his wrestling career. And then when they started coming into the MMA section, I knew already that I was going to be left out of it. But I was already used to it, that my name wasn't going to be mentioned about anything about his life and his career. And I was okay with it because I knew that that's how it was going to be. Wow. And when I sat down and it started, the way they introduced the, the way the, the the reasoning they gave why he started fighting was because Miu brought him and introduced him into fighting. Miu had nothing to do with fighting. Miu wasn't even a fighter. She was more of a she was just a wrestler, strictly a wrestler. And I I Ed, that was too much for me. I got up and left the room. Why would they even ask you room. to watch that shit? Yeah, I, I, did, I refused. As soon as I saw that part, I got up and left the room. I got up and left the room, and I, um, I called the manager over, and I told him that I need to talk to everyone who's responsible for this video. And what, what kind of tripped me out was this guy said, I'm responsible. I'll take full responsibility. And he wasn't. He wasn't the one. And I wanted. I wanted him to to take responsibility of it. <laughs> and he didn't. So the yakuza guy was next to me. I had. Uh, he had all these other guys around. I was starting to get mad. They noticed I was starting to get mad. It started getting crazy, and um, um, I I just let it out. I just told him the whole story. I just went up, and the, all the crazy B fighters were there, and I just told those guys that you know, the fact that you guys cut me out of his life is fine. I said, but if you're gonna gonna lie about it now, that's wrong. That's so di it's a di completely guy. different. That's a not even the same ballpark. I looked at the Yakuza guy, I looked at the uh, Crazy B fighters, and I said, you guys know the truth. I said, I don't expect you guys to stand against the gym and say, tell them that they're wrong, but don't stand with lies. 
if there's a lie being told, tell the truth. <clears throat> and I told, I told them, I told them, you know, the reason why I, I distanced myself from Kid was because the father, and it's because the father wanted to take money from Kid. You know, he wouldn't honor the, the contract, you know, so I, I had it out. Um, there, was, there was actually a, um, a video that was caught of that whole incident. And you can see, you can see the, um, the, the, all the, the people behind it. Yeah. See all the suit guys behind there. Yeah. So it, I, that, that just, that was, that's how everything ended, man. It's a shame. Yeah. Well, that's I mean, that's really why nice. that's why when you guys are talking about, you know, how close we were, we were really close. But I was when you were saying that, I was saying, oh shit, you guys they don't know what actually really happened, you know. <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah, think anyone is, knows. This is wild stuff, man. And I, I hate to see it like that when it goes down like that. I mean, you did so much, you put it all out there for you know him and then just how things played out. Uh that's very unfortunate. I mean, you know, I, I understand that how painful that can be. I've, I've had people in far the gym business, and I mean, people have been devastated over when, when that happens to them. As far as something similar, people, I've seen it happen many times. The trainer they ban and they go to a new trainer. I got to go to America Top Team. I got to go here, wherever they ban their loyal trainer, and the, the things never work out for them as well. It seems like, but it's a man. It's it's a hardcore business like that. Very cutthroat. I hate it. You know, you know what's really uh, what I've learned through this. There's a there's there's two things that people don't consider sicknesses that actually is a sickness, and that's fame and money. And the reason why I call it a sickness is because when you walk into fame and or money or both at the same time, if you're not careful, and you don't treat that sickness properly. It's going to overwhelm you and it's going to make you backstab people that you would never have backstabbed. So, you know, the father had that sickness and, you know, kid just didn't have a way to control that. You know, I don't, I don't hold it against him, man. You know, I mean, he was my little brother and it, fame and fame and money just uh, corrupted his mind. Uh, how much, how much do you think the Yakuza played into the corruption? No, um, I don't think the Yakuza had anything to do with it. I think it was the father. And, oh, you know what the funny thing is? That the Yakuza guy that was supposed to watch me, I, I met him for dinner a couple weeks later. And I, I wanted him to make a choice. That if you're going to support that lies, then I'm done with you. If you're going to support me, then you should be done with them. He chose me. Nice. nice. I actually found out from him that... Um, they put out all the money for the for the um, for the funeral, yeah. and you know people give money for the funeral. The money that accumulated from the fans and from the you know the people that gave money to their offerings for the for the funeral didn't even um, bring their money back that they paid for the for the for the whole ceremony. But the dad called them. And asked them to set aside thirty thousand to give to him. He so sold. Wow. Yeah. No. So, I mean, without anything else being said, we you, you can see what ha what the dad was like, and that was the that was the big reason why me and kid had a falling out. I always um, blamed him and said, you know, kid's not bad. It's the dad. It's the dad. But. It came down to the bottom line that, you know, kid's an adult. He can make his own decisions. And in a way, I did get kind of backstabbed by him, too. Oh, yeah. Well, do you think, so, uh, have you seen kid's father since then in public? No. I've seen him at the rising events, but, I mean, they, they avoid me with a plague. They probably should. <laughs> Well, it's just uncomfortable, you know. I mean, it's, they know what they did, you know. Inside, they have to know, you know. You know, you know the funny thing about that. 
I don't even know if the dad really knows what he did. That's how bad the sickness is. I don't even know if he knows what he did. That's how bad it is. And I, yeah. I would have to, I would have to assume every time they see you, they probably would want to look away just for no knowing that they were wrong. There, you know what I mean? To, not to deal with that. I mean, you can think whatever you want in your head, but you see that you know, and so you probably would try to avoid you just to. You don't want to deal with the truth. You know what I mean? You would live in that fantasy world. You're good. You you do this to help everybody. But in the back of your head, you have to know that they they have to know they're wrong. So I would I would can see them trying to avoid you like the plague. Like you said, they don't want to see that. That just makes them feel the truth. They don't want that. Yeah. Possible is possible for a normal person, but I, I almost sometimes put it put it even to a more more extent, saying that you know that they they possibly might not even realize what they yeah, do and who they are. That, he's that, a that's far blown. Wow. Yeah, he's a narcissist. Yeah, yeah he's a narcissist. He's that exactly. far yeah. off. You know, like Amber Heard actually thinks she's right giving all these interviews now. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Hey, right back. You're right. You know, those people, they're, they're delusional with the fact that, you know, just now I'm right. Like now you, you can't you be know, more wrong. They don't see it, I guess. I've been watching you know, the Amber Heard trial. And at first I'm, I'm pretty much like, what a bitch she's a liar what the hell is she doing getting riled up on it and now when you see her even talking after the tr- verdict's done yeah i look at it more like holy shit something's wrong with her oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's not i don't it doesn't upset it's not like she's a bitch no, it's like, oh shit she's sick no she, she, believe, yeah, she believes that stuff she believes she's right and that's how delusional the delusional they don't get reality man it's so funny i mean ugh. You know, you know what I is, is the finishing touch on it for me too. Like, what really makes it bad is, you know, kid was forty one when he passed away, and it's so you know, much life. Yeah, it, it, but keep in mind, like, he died in another fighter's arms with another. Not his father taking care of him or his family. Like, if he had gone back to his family and really reconciled with them. And but that doesn't seem to have existed. You know, it's like yeah, I can almost see. Picking family, you know, that makes it hard, but that wasn't the choice. It was always money and then everything else. That's kind of sad. I never, of it. I, never, I never thought of that. That's true. He didn't turn to his family. No. He turned to his friend. It's crazy, man. No yeah, problem. I mean, and, and, you know, they got to look at it this way. He makes the announcement, and three weeks later, he passed. His family should have been there. They had time. Like, they had time. It's crazy stuff, man. Oh God, man. I feel, I feel like we you did know, a therapy you know, session. I think we have so much here. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, you know, you know what's real funny about that is um I thought it was really neat because he he wanted to keep it a secret until the day he died because he didn't want nobody to know him as a weak person. Holy shit. Yeah. So the only reason why they came out was because the gossip magazines got that picture of him. So he wanted, he had, he felt they, they already knew. So then he wanted to make the announcement. Um, the funny thing is, is I'm going through a situation right now with, you know, my, my ex trainer, Santi Noy shot himself in the heart. Ooh. You know, no. the, the Muay Thai, he's like the deadly kisser. He's the only one who beat Roman Decker when Roman Decker was beating all the Thai champions. Okay. Santi Noy. But I, haven't been to Thailand because of COVID. I used to, I helped him build his gym that he has now. He was like a brother. I financially helped him. And after he got on his feet, he refused to let me pay for any dinners. He took care of me. We hugged each other every time he, you know, he was so happy to see me. He passed away. Yeah. I haven't been to the gym yet. I'm going to go to the gym in the end of the year. It's going to be a super hard visit for me. Yeah, that's he shot, did, he, did he donate his brain to science? I don't know. A lot of times when, when athletes shoot themselves in the heart, it is for the... I think he shot himself in the heart because he his, his teacher died. And he had so much pain in his heart, I think he wanted to end the pain in his heart and he shot himself in the heart. Oh. But I'm going to go to, the, to visit his gym in November. It's going to be a super hard trip. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling hard, telling hard. I'm talking about it right now. Yeah, you know, Anson. Let me tell you so, something, man. So you know, you know that visit is um, something that I don't know how I'm going to feel. I don't know how I'm going to battle it when I get to the gym. But I'm going to, I'm going to document it. 
Why? Because I'm not here saying that I don't want people to see a weak ensign. I'm here because there are going to be a lot of people that's going to go through this. San Noy, the way he handled it was shooting himself. It doesn't have to be that way. I want to show the people how I deal with it. Every step of the way, how the pain I go through. I'm probably going to lose it when I'm there. I have this funny feeling that I want to sit by the place that he shot himself and just have time. Mm. So I'm going to cover, I'm going to get all that. And the reason why I want to get that on video is because I'm going to put aside the fact that I don't want people to see me the weak ensign. I want people to learn from it and help people be able to conquer a problem like that when they face it one day and not resort to killing themselves. So, you know, me and Kid were two different people. He chose to hide his, his battle with cancer. I mean, I choose not to. I choose to display my, my weaknesses. So people that are going to go through the same thing, hopefully there's something that I did can help people from doing something drastic or help them handle the situation better. So awesome. I love that, man. You're showing strength and, and showing other people that, man, hey, this is tough for me too, but this is how I'm going to handle it. I'm not going to take I'm going to, I'm not want you to see this stuff. I'm, I'm a teacher to the end, man. You're being a teacher mm -hmm. right now to help benefit other people. That's a true teacher. It's not about you. It's about how you affect other people's lives, man. That's, that's what true coaching or, or teaching is, man. I love that. I was, I was, I was, I'm convinced that I was put on this earth to help people, nothing else, not to become super famous, not to become super rich. I was put on this earth to help people. And lo and behold, the universe has still steered me into making power stone braces that are actually help people with health. And until the day I die, I think that will be my, my objective and my motivation to go on is to do whatever I can in my life to my last day to help people and you know i mean that's gonna, just that's just the way i i i have the outlook on life now we're yeah, gonna put a link in the bio for where people can buy your bracelets um and so the last time you were on sometimes what happens is we call each other up giddy like children like we can't believe we got that good interview chris called me up yelling at me that's the type of interviews we do. That's a real man. We're real fighters. You know, <laughs> there's not too many SOBs like Edson around anymore. He's like yelling at me, like, you know, giving like a, a coach, well, you know, coming, get more coming, of these. <laughs> coming from, from coming from someone like, like Chris, man. I mean, I, I looked up to Chris career too. He's a freaking warrior, man. I mean, Thank coming you. from someone like Chris is like, like, like probably the biggest compliment I can have. Yeah, oh, hell no, man. You, you're you're yeah. the old school warrior, man. You know, you're the people I looked up to. So just uh, like I said, when as soon as I get done with the interview with Mike, I was uh, yeah, like a like a little kid all happy about it. So yeah, 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 I, yeah. Th th this is the same way. So, man, I just uh, this is the reason we do this podcast to have people yeah. like you on. Your yes. Mind, man. For real. For yeah, that's, keep that's, your story that's, alive. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, super, simply amazing to me, too. Everything you did in the ring, obviously, everything like that, but your ability to explain to us culture and nuances and your ability to deal with both of those very different cultures, that's a talent all onto itself, my man. You know, they're like there are normal people who can't do that, as well as handling a, a, a fighting career and stuff. That's amazing. And what you're going to go through in November as an observer. You know, that bond that fighters get, like, after they fought or with a coach and stuff like that, when you see it and you feel it as an observer, you sense it. You feel it's there. Yeah, it's and real. There's something really special and untouchable about what happens, like, you know, with two guys that fought 20 minutes in hug or when there's real transfer of information there. And you being vulnerable and showing that is another aspect of what fighting is really about. It is part of making those, those connections and bonds. So thank you, man. No, thank, thank you, so you guys. Like so always, you're a friggin', you're the man, bro. You're the friggin' like, man. Like I always say about, you know, mixed martial arts has made me who I am today. And I, uh, the, you know, the wife I have today, the, the bracelet business I have, the schools that I have, the respect that I have and the legacy that I have is all because of martial arts. And 
guys that you guys that are helping promote the sport and, and show the world that this is the best sport in the world. Um, I appreciate that. Awesome. Anson, if you're ever close to a BKFC event, you got to make it out. Oh my Chris. God. You don't know how bad I want to go check one of those out, man. I watch them all. <laughs> I watch them all, man. Oh man. They're and so good. We're going to London. I just, London. Wish, I just wish this came out 20 years ago. I would have loved to jump in there, man. Oh my God. Done it. <laughs> That's all I keep saying, man. I was like, I, I came out of retirement to have three fights, but I was like 43, 44, 45 when I had, I was like, man, where was this when I was in my 20s and 30s? At least in my 30s, I would have done it in a heartbeat, man. It's, it's everything I love about fighting, but uh, I'm old as hell now. So. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you know, talk, talk, talk to one of your friends with, the, you know, the guys that like to wear funny suits and sunglasses at three in the morning, you know, your friends over there, and have them sponsor a bare knuckle event, man. Come on. <laughs> talk to Dave Feldman. We'll get that done before yeah. you know it. Yeah, you know, Edson, during during London, July is it August? August twentieth. August twentieth. Yeah, we'll be in London. I don't know what kind of a plane ride that is for you. Ah, shit! I'll be in Hawaii. I'll be in Hawaii. I'll be opening up my shop in Hawaii, my bracelet shop in Hawaii. (laughs) I'll definitely be watching it on Utah. I'll be watching it on uh, pay per view. I order all your stuff, man. I order all the bare knuckle stuff they're fun to watch man i love them so. fun for everybody hey, <laughs> hey i i man I, it's i appreciate your time once again man you're awesome everything we uh every time we talk to you, it's awesome stuff great information once again um man you're the man i appreciate you being here thank you thank you guys man god damn that was good thanks Edson. wow mike so we just uh Lights Out Podcast here, and uh, I don't know. This may be my most emotional podcast that I think we've accomplished here. This was our Kid Yamamoto deep dive. Uh, you know, Kid passed away, so we had his, you know, mentor, Ensign Inoue, take us through the early part of his career and, uh, you know, to take us through some of the behind-the-scenes stuff that happened between the two. And Man, it got heavy. I'm like, wow. Man, <laughs> did you tear up, dude? Yeah, no, I've done, you know, and I me cried too. after too, you know. Yeah, me too. Me I, too. I went and looked for photos, you know, the photos that we talked about of kid, you know, like near the end and stuff. And a few of the photos you can find on the internet, you know. Yeah, yeah, they, there's, they'll bring you, there's, they'll bring you to tears, man. I, I was not, I, I, I feel like with this podcast, that unfortunately we're gonna have more of this, and that is you know, emotional stuff where, you know, we have 117 podcasts on our belts and we've had a couple of guys that, you know, could be tragic and turned out to kind of be, you know, positive people anyway, you know, like guys that, you know, like Javier Trevino getting cut from the UFC, he could have been like bitter as hell, but he wasn't, you know, just average, you know, that bitterness hasn't been there and the tragedies really haven't been there. And to me, this was a whole, you know, kid, kid and all the stuff that Ensign revealed with, you know, the politics of, that his family put him through his entire career and how that affected their relationship. I think, I think this is the first full-fledged MMA tragedy in my book. I, I, I don't know. You know, I'm glad we well, did it. I'm very glad, but. Yeah. Hurt. So, so we knew we were, you guys got to think of it this way. When Ensign Enyue leaves this planet, so do those stories. You know, they're going to be forgotten. And if you listen to our first instant interview, I, I think in regards to response of people, I don't think we have a podcast that we had as many people sending us messages. Well, Scott Bissack was close to with Lion's Den of saying, get him back on, get him back on. And, you know, Ensign is just, you might not like what he has to say, but He's not lying. And it's not one of those, well, he's telling his truth. No, man. Like he's, he's even telling you situations where somebody, people that he cares about, um, you know, the, the situation might not have been pretty. The thing about Kid Yamamoto is he's got quality wins in three different weight classes. And he never fought at 125 until the very end of his career where he was, he was done. So had he got a win at 125, it would have been four 
weight classes. So he's somebody that is truly special. And if you listen to the first Sensen interview, we, we talked to him about Miguel Torres. Why did that fight never take place? Well, the reason why is because the Miguel Torres talk took place after he and Ensign split. Like in that interview, like I, I just thought, you know, maybe Ensign, maybe just maybe had forgotten. Yeah, maybe there was like a little brain fart or something of that nature. No, all, all of those communications took place afterward. Yeah, and, it, was, yeah. It, it sounded like it was a hard cut. Like that was my last fight. I cornered him. And, that, you know, after that, it was like we were friends, but he didn't, you know, the loyalty didn't match up. That's why, you know, that's why I think kid's a tragic figure. You know, here's a guy that, at, you know, after beating Genki Sudo, Hoyler Gracie, and uh, the third guy was no slouch either in that tournament. Yeah. He was probably pound for pound the number one guy in the world. Yes. It, it, was, let's, we, we need to kind of clean it up a little bit. We didn't get to this during a podcast. So kid passed away from stomach cancer, but he also tried to, like, I think he went through chemotherapy, chemotherapy once or twice. Don't quote me on the number, but I know he went through it. It made him so sick that he did not like it and tried to heal himself holistically. And like a true warrior, you know, decided to continue down that path. And, um, you know, eventually it took his life. I mean, it's, um, the Japan culture is a lot different than many of us mainlanders here in the United States can kind of wrap our heads around. But that head of households, the structure, the pecking order, man, that shit's real, bro. That's real. Yeah, yeah. You know, Ensign does a terrific job of, of, of giving us those nuances, you yeah. know, in, in the first interview as well as in this one about Kid. There was a lot of it, you know, in this one. I, I believe that in, in that case, and I, I've had access to, you know, in the MMA circles in Japan, there have been stories of, like, for example, guys that had boxing trainers. And that the boxing trainers actually had to work their corner in disguise at MMA shows, like hide their identities so that they wouldn't be identified by boxing people who are shunning MMA and don't want them involved. Yeah. And I think that probably also happens with wrestling and with uh, judo and with many of the martial arts over there where the sumo, you know, once you're involved in that world, that world becomes so big, like seems to have affected, you know, Yamamoto's father with wrestling being a paramount, you know, force in their lives. Like, the, you know, they, you know, and um, overall, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm wrapped up. I also think of, of the old boxer, Joe Gans, that, you know, was, was a lightweight world champion. Uh, was the one of the first it was the first black lightweight world champion and it, it's called the old master so the guy is among the, the guys from the 19 early 1900s that fought the top guys considered him a master and he fought with tuberculosis at the end of his career you know 40 round fights and eventually died like a, 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 a only a year or two after his last long title fight wow um a, a tragic figure. And I think, I think, you know, Kid Yamamoto, though, you know, it's evocative to me. I like that, you know, a, a training partner was with him at the end. You know, it talks about that relationship we were talking about at the end with Ensign uh, of how combat athletes seem to have a bond at times. Um, but again, the tragedy there is, is, is you, 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 you know, he didn't die with his parents, with his family or, or any of that type of image. Maybe, you know, we don't know everything, you know, how all that went down. But to me, this has the makings of that MMA, tra you know, the first of the MMA tragedies that we're actually facing, you know, face the you future. Know, and you and I, we, like you said, we've got 117 interviews in the can. Ensign Inoue is at the top of my list of guys I'd like to hang out with and just shut up and mm -hmm. listen. You know, like... He's kind of like Hawaii Japan, Hawaii and Japan version of Coleman, except he does interviews. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, he's, he's like Mark. He's, he's actually, 
an amazing study, you know, because the, the fact is, is to be, to be an elite martial artist at, at his level, you know, you got to have something, you know, and a lot of the times to have that, they don't like press or uh, undue attention or having to explain things to, you know, lesser athletes and stuff where it's like, oh, this, this conversation again, you know, and, but yeah, he overcomes all that. He's like a people person too. Like, it's like, you know, the guy's like multi-talented on, on many levels. So yeah, I, I I I enjoy, and I, I always feel like I walked away. He's got a, a little bit of that Jeremy Horn quality too, yeah. where it's like you do feel like, hey, you know, all right, like the bell rang and you left school after the interview, you know. <laughs> so you know what I, I think. Uh, I think the important thing is is that uh, the guy gave he led us in his life, and um, like we we got a piece of events in there. We really yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. You know, in a connection I, to kids. To, to me, you know what was he says so much. I, I can't. I, I at this point, I haven't reheard the interview or anything like that. But just the, the one line that just really deserves a laugh and everybody to enjoy it is how naturally he was like, yeah. So we were. I was talking to the K one people and they gave me the contract and I put it in my pocket and I walked away saying, you know. Uh, I'm not going to give you back the contract, you know, da, 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 da. and then I was like, yeah, great job, you know, now take it to a lawyer, and he goes, and I took it right to my gangster friend. <laughs> <Yeah. You know? laughs> no lawyers needed it, I love that, you know what I mean? I, I, you know, I guess we don't operate like that in, in America at, uh, you know, uh, so you know, deeply, you know, so comfortably. <laughs> so, so with Ensign also, like, like we said, there's a lot of structure, there's, you know, tradition with Japan. With Ensign, it's kind of, it's exactly the opposite of what Japan is used to. But it seems like he walked into a den full of gangsters, announced that he was one too. And if anybody would like to step up, please do so. If not, you know, it's kind of like the, the story of Mark Schultz with the black belt. Like, oh, you're not going to promote me to black belt? Anyone that can take this off of me, I'll say I'm not. You know, it's one of those situations. and. Nah, it's, it's special. Ladies and gentlemen, you got to like, share, subscribe. It's the only way this podcast grows. Right now, I think we, we, we get about a thousand downloads per episode right now, if you kind of look at all of our mediums. And, um, you know, we're kind of stuck there. And it would if you want stuff like this to get out, it, it really helps us if, if you guys share and subscribe. And, you know, we can find more stories like this. Like, I've got to meet Ensign anyway. Like, I, I always thought he was cool. But after talking to him twice, it's like, I'm like a super fan now. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, it's been 15 years since I've been to a hostess bar in Tokyo. And it all came rushing back when you mentioned it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Mark, I, 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 right around the corner, we're going to do another Ken, Kevin Randleman little tribute with uh, Eric Smith. Coleman has told us he's coming back on to talk about Japan. Um, I'm researching Royce Alger right now. We're going to have Mark Schultz make another appearance. And we've got a meeting on Saturday about trying to figure out how to accept a prison phone call from Andy Anderson. So we got a lot on our plate. We're, we're, we're trying to kind of you know, let whatever comes first happen and kind of go from there. Uh, I'm tracking down Mike Van Arsdale, too. Oh, Mike you. Van Arsdale. And, you know, I also got two phone numbers. Three. I got Matt Horwich. Alan Belcher and um, Joey Biasenor. So those three, you know, within the next few months are going to be coming our way as well. I think we should line all those up. Uh, yeah, Van, Ar cool. Van Aristotle especially, yes. So uh, hats off to Ensign, um, you know, rest in peace to Kid Yamamoto and thank him for, you know, everything he gave us in the ring as well. He uh, needs a statue. He, you know, anyway needs, or not anyway, but Kid Yamamoto needs a statue. And it needs to be in Guam, and Ensign Anyway's name needs to be on that plaque. That's my personal feelings. Yeah, you know, I mean, some type of, we, we, we have another segment called MMA Artifacts in the Museum and stuff like that. And some of, you know, kids' accomplishments in MMA and, and in kickboxing and in the media in Japan and stuff will certainly be a part of any real MMA museum, you know. So, you know, he'll get his, his due there. Um, but I think that the personal side of his story also again, like I said, I think I think that yeah, I have the feeling that we just ran into like a Joe Gans or 
of Barbados yeah. uh, Joe Walcott story, like yeah. from boxing, where it's like this was, you know, at 41 gone, it's way too soon anyway. But then, you know, the all the baggage he carried, like and Ensign too, Ensign, the, as you pointed out, Ensign, you know, Ensign said, you know, I was dealing, I had to go face the father who also happens to be the father of my wife, <laughs> you know? Oh. So it's not like I got to go talk to my student's dad. It's like, you know, he's already Miguel, dealt with the guy. <laughs> he's never, he's never been asked like that question before. And that's why I said, you know, we can edit it out if you're not comfortable, but that was, he got the child to defy the father. And, you know, whether he acknowledges that or not, that's pretty freaking significant, man. Yeah, I don't, like, I don't know. You knew the fact that's not going to that. Gonna, I, I don't know that's if not he gonna, got him to do it. I think he hated MMA. He made but kid, I, but we didn't get to it. He made kid try out for the Olympics again. And that's where kid blew his knee out and he never really recovered. He blew his knee out on uh, fighting a takedown. He never recovered from that. Like, I, I've got it all documented. I thought we'd get to it. We didn't because. Ensign wasn't around, and, and Ensign's never told anybody why he left. So it's, it's yeah. It's he, a there huge were a couple dinner. times he, he revealed stuff that he said he'd never revealed. Like, like, and he has always been honest in interviews and stuff. So we have some new territory here with Ensign, and I, I'm proud proud as hell of that podcast. Thank you very much, Miguel. You did awesome. You did awesome, dude. You really kind of helped open it up. Chris being there also helped. He's been at BKFC land, as we like to say, for a minute, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's, awesome. all, it's all much better with Chris there. I love I, 100%. I it was good to see Mr. Lytle, uh, the big boss, checking in with us for, for the big podcast. We see how his ego's going. All right, Chris. But uh, thank you very Either much, way. guys. Love Let's you, brother. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.